We had an eventful week on the stock markets. This is certainly worth talking about. When our society discusses issues politely with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. The Dow Jones Industrial Average took a 1,300-point nosedive in the middle of this week. The legacy media immediately came out with a bunch of articles pinning the drop to President Trump and making sure that we all knew that this was a sign of terrible things yet to come. I've mentioned before how on fire the U.S. economy is, but I need to address this situation. So without further ado, this is where we were on January 20th, 2009, the date of Barack Obama's inauguration. The Dow Jones Industrial Average had plunged from a high of 14,168.53 on June 29, 2007 to a mere 7949.09 at the close of trading, a loss of 43.88% of the value of the index in just 205 days. By comparison, the stock market crash in October 1929 dropped the Dow Jones Industrial Average from a peak of 381.17 to 41.22 on July 8, 1932, a total loss of 89.19% of its peak value. In both cases, the factor which precipitated the crash was bad speculation. In 1929, the market was inflated by people borrowing money to leverage stocks on contract, the same way the commodities are still traded. In 2007, mortgage lenders packaged financially risky adjustable rate mortgages which they had made to marginally qualified buyers and resold the mortgages as investments, dumping the risk of foreclosure and loss with the bundled mortgages and creating the housing bubble. Market bubbles pop. Always. The tech bubble popped, creating the first dip of the Great Recession. The housing bubble popped, creating the second dip. That's what Obama inherited just as Franklin Delano Roosevelt inherited the Great Depression. Roosevelt's policies were helping the markets to slowly recover until 1936, when the second dip of the Great Depression happened. The Dow had recovered to nearly 200 points when the administration started to tighten monetary policy and balance the federal budget causing a sharp decline in markets and an unemployment spike. The economy bounced back, but the markets remained essentially stagnant for several more years. Market uncertainty persisted through 1942, but the bulls started to run on Wall Street in December 1942 because of massive increases in industrial production to support the war effort and a tightening labor market. 
That growth persisted throughout the war until a small market downturn and stagnation held up growth until 1951, when the bulls began to run yet again. The day Obama took office, the market dropped over 300 points. Not exactly a signal that business had confidence in the new president. Unemployment was high, although, although nowhere close to what America experienced in the Great Depression. Industrial jobs disappeared. The new president extended benefits, just as Roosevelt had done almost 80 years before. But the market bottomed out at 6507 on March 9, 2009. That was an overall loss of 54.06% of peak value in about 18 months. Survivors of the Great Depression talked about how this reminded them of what their childhoods were like. America started demanding that the president use his position to propose legislation to get the economy kick-started. Obama responded by stating that the manufacturing jobs were gone for good. The markets recovered from March 2009 to May 2015, roughly tripling their value. But this was a jobless recovery. The unemployment rate did not drop in keeping with the growth in market value, and major companies like General Electric were posting annual loss after annual loss. Labor force participation, a key statistic in labor markets, was dropping several points from a peak of 67% to around 61 or 62%. That meant that millions of people had left the job market entirely. Tech was booming again, but the U.S. economy had shifted significantly towards more service products instead of manufactured goods. President Obama tried to help by guaranteeing affordable health care to everyone in the U.S. But was it really health care or affordable? Um, no. Just, no. Okay, basic economics here. The biggest expense for most companies is payroll. When payroll costs go up, companies look for ways to reduce those costs. That means increased efficiency measures, hiring freezes, wage freezes, and eventually trimming the number of people on the payroll. The Affordable Care Act mandated that all companies with a payroll of 50 or more employees must provide medical insurance to all full-time employees and set the threshold for full-time at 30 hours per week instead of the previous 36 hours per week. Most employers responded by increasing the percentage of part-time employees that they hired and capping their hours at about 28 per week to make certain that they did not become full-time. The hiring of independent contractors instead of employees also increased. To add to the pain of working part-time because full-time jobs were contracting, the ACA required that everyone not covered by employer health insurance must pay a tax penalty for not buying individual insurance. That was something just not affordable for most part-time employees, but the penalty was much less than the cost of insurance. Instead of buying the insurance, the part-time employees paid the penalty, which was usually held out of the tax refund that they were already getting, and went without insurance. Ergo, health insurance premiums shot through the roof as healthy people who bought the insurance, paid the premiums, yet didn't use the catastrophic benefits, went away, fueling a significant portion of the market boom as the cost of literally everything spiked. Fuel, food, clothes, housing, everything. Don't believe me? With the market recovery, why didn't the Federal Reserve raise the federal funds rate during the Obama administration? Monetary policy states that a booming economy needs to be cooled off by increasing the cost of lending in order to prevent inflation. The goal is to keep the FRR just below the rate of economic growth. If the FRR is too high, stocks and property values will tumble. The pre-Obama administration FRR was 5.25%. The FRR was lowered to 0% in 2008 and remained below 1% for the entire Obama administration. A low rate means more borrowing because borrowing becomes much cheaper. It didn't hit 1% again until March 2017, nor 2% again until June of 2018, after President Trump took office, and after several quarters in a row of GDP growth above 3% per quarter. Now on January 20th, 2017, Donald Trump's inaugural day, the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed at 19,732.40. Between then and January 26, 2018, the Dow added almost 7,000 points in steady growth. 
There was a short dip in the first quarter of 2018, right around the time that the labor market began to tighten up enough to start driving median wages higher. Yet even after the Dow had lost 2,800 points in two months, the Fed raised the FRR a quarter percent to 1.75 percent and the market recovered to a new record high. If you look at the dates when the Federal Reserve raised the FRR again, then you will see that they will coincide with market downturns roughly a week later. On September 26, 2018, the Federal Reserve raised the FRR again to 2.25%. A week later, the Dow peaked at just under 27,000 points. The next day, the market downturn began. I mentioned market bubbles before, right? Here's another term for you, a market correction. When the market is overvalued in a robust economy, occasionally there will be a sell-off to gather profits from the high values of stocks before the market dips again. If enough shares are sold by investors, they can trigger the dip themselves. That's the correction. With so many funds using computer algorithms to try to stay ahead of market trends, these sell-offs can grow swiftly as each sale drops the price a bit more, triggering more selling. Ever seen dominoes being tipped? Same effect. The only way to stop it once it starts is for traders to manually place orders for undervalued stocks, especially after hours, and set puts thresholds of value for certain stocks which, when reached, the algorithms will purchase more shares of these stocks. This can be seen in action right now. Google JP Morgan Chase and PUT. And you will see articles from this past week where investment advisors were recommending PUTs on JPM, a Dow-listed company which just released an above-expected 24% increase in their recent quarterly earnings over those from one year ago. When strong earnings reports are released, the normal response is to buy more stock, especially when the stock is considered undervalued like JPM is right now. Friday, the market bounced back, closing up about 300 points. This is beginning to reverse the losses since October 3rd. And that's the hallmark of a market correction. I think that we will see fairly steady growth for the rest of the year and a great fourth quarter season for retailers. Now, I'm not an economist, I'm just a layperson who watches the markets carefully because I have a retirement fund to keep an eye on. My recommendation to you, watch the markets next week. They should be interesting. Now, that's just my opinion. Comment below to share yours. If you like this video, check out my playlists. Check out these channels I have subscribed for more great content. New episodes are coming, so subscribe and ring the bell.